that, that I know we have uh, more coming in, so we really appreciate uh, you all being here this evening. We want to be sensitive to the time because uh, we know that that's a, a precious commodity, particularly this season, uh, this time of the year. So we really appreciate uh, you all being here. We have been a little busy here uh, the last couple of weeks uh, as Raleigh will kind of end our uh, little tour here, kick off here of the uh, special needs ESA uh, kind of information sessions here. And uh, this is really going off well. We kicked it off in Wilmington. Uh, there uh, at the University of, of UNC of Wilmington. Uh, and then um, last week we were at Hot Point, kind of the crowd there, and, and uh, we're capping off here in Raleigh. We're really excited, um, especially in the education savings account. Uh, it's, our th it's our third uh, private school option uh, here in North Carolina. Uh, we are a state here in the last few years since 2011. Uh, you'd be hard to find another state that's really uh, looked at some uh, out of the box ways and educational uh, measures here to complement our uh, public education system in terms of providing uh, uh, some school loans for uh, school opportunities for, for our children. So we're, we're a very fortunate state. Uh, you'll hear from some of our key leaders here, uh, here, here soon. And uh, I know we not only have uh, families that are interested uh, to learn more about this program here, but I know we also have school leaders as well. And so uh, this is a, a real optimum time. I mean, we're, we're really excited about these opportunities, ladies and gentlemen, because you know we know how hard it is to start something new. This is a new program, although uh, we have two other uh, private school measures. We have uh, robust uh, charter school, uh, public charter school front here. Whenever, whenever you're trying uh, implementing a program for the first year, the first time, uh, you, you want to get out of many uh, kinks and you want to get ahead of time questions answered. And, uh, and we're very fortunate. Um, my name is Daryl Allison, by the way, President of Parents for Education of Freedom in North Carolina. It's been a long day. Well, it's Monday, you know. And, and we've got Thanksgiving. We're hosting a lot of that. Packed up. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But, uh, but uh, we, we are very fortunate uh, as an organization. To, to disengage as many families as you all across the state. And it's just been very rewarding uh, to see and to hear uh, some of these measures right here that's been passed right across the street from the North Carolina General Assembly. Uh, how is it being impact, how is it impacting your lives in our community? It's very, very important. But not only have we, uh, Parents for Education Freedom in North Carolina, on this floor, we're very fortunate uh, to have a fine institution uh, the North Carolina State Education Assistance Authority. Uh, they are the agency uh, that oversees and administers uh, uh, our private school programs, including uh, the Special Needs ESA. So, you know, they've been with us uh, every step of the way here in Wilmington, Hot Point, and here again in Raleigh. It's a very fortunate uh, opportunity for you. I see some of you had your pens and your pads. Please use those in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, because you'll be hearing from Kathy Marker, uh, kind of the director, the director uh, administering uh, this program, and you'll be getting fresh information, real information, on-time information from the source, uh, not second-hand, third-hand, but first-hand. And more importantly, you're getting that information ahead of time. Uh, this program uh, officially opens its uh, doors, if you will, to applications here February 1st, 2018. So it's really, really cool here that in November uh, you're getting a chance to, to get the information as well as answer, uh, ask any questions you have. And then ultimately, too, which is very important, we have some information for you. Uh, we ask that you all please complete all the following information. There's a card here. What we want to do as an organization uh, from November to February, there could be some changes, some tweaks, and things of that nature. You may have some follow-up questions as Meriated on, on this information. Uh, we want you to look at organization being an extension of it. Uh, and so uh, I promise you, we will not sell your information to a vendor. Uh, uh, you won't be getting all kind of calls and crazy emails. Uh, from us, what we want to do is make sure that you have good, relevant information so that as parents, as guardians, um, you all are making the best decision you can possibly make. Uh, with real information, accurate information. We, we know that at the end of the day, it really isn't the school that makes it. But the key formula is an engaged parent, 
uh, working with a, a good teacher uh, and the byproduct and the beneficiary of that would be that student as long as our students engaged. And so we want to make sure that we're doing our part to help you, organization, parents for educational freedom in North Carolina. So uh, just a quick overview. Uh, you're going to hear from some, some pretty important people here. Um, and uh, we're so happy to have them here. Uh, you hear from a prominent uh, 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 state senator who had a lot to do with this program. Uh, so we're simply happy to have him. And then we're also going to have a, a policy analyst kind of give us a perspective. You know, North Carolina became the sixth state in the nation uh, to have an ESA program. And so we're going to hear uh, from a policy expert here a little bit about kind of the national trend and, and also what's been percolated here in North Carolina. So we're very happy to, uh, to have him. And then following uh, uh, those two uh, individuals, we have Kathy Marker, uh, who will go through a, a PowerPoint presentation. Again, uh, she's with the North Carolina State Education Assistance Authority. So I know you've got some comfortable chairs, but that's pretty much when you're going to kind of lean in a little bit and clear out the ears a little bit here. Uh, and, and really, uh, really be intent there. Then uh, uh, we'll then have after the presentations, we'll then uh, have uh, legislator policy, uh, uh, Catherine Marker, uh, and uh, one of our special needs advocates come up, and we have a Q and A, question and answer. So the other card that you have, in order for us to kind of maximize the time, we want to be sensitive to your time at the same, at the same time, maximize as much as we possibly can. If you don't mind, ahead of time, or doing the presentation from Kathy, if you have some burning questions, you can go ahead and fill that out. Uh, we have a card here, fill out your question. We will collect those under the por portion of the program, and then when we get to Q&A, we'll just fire off those questions and try to get as many questions answered as possible. Again, I want to preface that, obviously, uh, we have limited time here, so uh, I don't want you to be concerned if you didn't get, you know, that question that you had uh, answered. Why? Because we want to make sure that we stay in touch with you. We pledge as an organization to get an answer to your question. We pledge as an organization to not just rely on today, uh, but we want to be with you through the course of this time frame. We're a nonprofit organization. We will not see you a bill. We just want to make sure that parents and guardians individuals are, are getting information uh, and making the best decision they can possibly make uh, for, for their child's education. It's very important to us. And listen, I have the honor um, to introduce a, a, a good, strong, solid leader. Uh, and I mean that. Uh, Senator Chair Barefoot is currently serving his third term in the North Carolina Senate. <coughs> He is the youngest member of the Senate and represents the 18th district, which includes Wake and Franklin counties. Now, he's the youngest, but let me tell you something. He's been here. I think he's been here before. He's old old so. And uh, in the Senate, Chad serves as chairman of the State Appropriation Subcommittee on Education, Higher Education, Senate Education, Higher Education Committee. Uh, in his first term, Chad garnered national attention for successfully passing into law one of the most comprehensive student data uh, privacy bills in the country. Senator Barefoot was focused, uh, his focus is legislative efforts toward ensuring that North Carolina students are prepared for success in higher education and the workforce, and he's the leading sponsor of this program that you're going to hear tonight. Uh, Senator Barefoot is Vice President of the Institutional Advancement at Lewisburg College, the state's only two-year college and the oldest junior college in the nation. So that's his bio. But let me tell you, this guy's a real deal. And um, I don't know how much you'll share uh, with you here, but uh, when I tell you uh, you have a leader, we have a leader. Now, although he represents officially Wake and Franklin counties, let me be very candid with you, he has had impact in all 100 counties because of the position he holds here and, and the emphasis he's put, the policies put in place, not only at K-12 level, but also higher ed. Uh, this state is uh, very, very, very um, uh, indebted uh, to this uh, young man's leadership. We would not be where we are today uh, but for strong leaders like Senator Chad Barefoot. And so without further ado, help me welcome Senator Chad Barefoot. Well, 
first I'd like to say thank you to Daryl and the Parents for Educational Freedom for uh, having me here tonight to talk about um, a bill and an issue that is uh, very close to my heart. Uh, the only additional biographical information I'll give you is that I'm the father of three little children, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old. And so I, I care very deeply about the future of education in the state of North Carolina. And I think as a parent, I've got a little skin in the game like many of you in the audience. And so that's why when we started to look around and think about how we could help parents and how we could help students, um, the decision to introduce a bill to develop an education savings account became a high priority. North Carolina already has a few um, school choice programs, and in my opinion, you can't have enough. I think that the more that we can do to empower parents and empower students with choices, uh, to find educational solutions that best fit your individual needs is something that policymakers should be pursuing in this state. And so what the ESA does at the outset is it provides additional support for families with students of children with special needs. It also creates a situation where the education savings account can be used in addition to the uh, disabilities grant that, we, that already exists in state law. And this can help cover the full cost for tuition. What we know with, with students with special needs is, depending on the type of special need they have, it, the cost can vary as to how much uh, the education requires. And so as we began this past session and we looked out there to see what the solutions were, we realized the solutions that we currently have for special needs only helped a small slice of the pot. And we wanted to expand the amount of families that we could impact uh, with this particular legislation. And, and we believe that's one of the reasons why the bill, when introduced, was supported bipartisanly. Um, there was another senator who introduced the bill with me um, who has a child with special needs from Wilmington, and there was another senator uh, who was also a Democrat that helped introduce the bill with me as well. So it was a bipartisan effort in the General Assembly, and I think it was a need that everyone recognized uh, was something that we could, we could tackle. I'll tell you one important story that really stuck with me, and, and that is the job that we are doing regarding special needs education early on in a child's life has got to be a prime focus for this state. Um, I have children that are very young, and I know what those young development years are like. And I, I, have, I don't want to be too specific about it, but everyone has issues with their children, and I have children that have issues, and the sooner you can get them help, uh, the more of an impact you can make later on in their life. And I feel like the education savings accounts, along with some of the other programs we have, empower you to help your children get the help they need sooner rather than later. And I think one of the things that's most discouraging to me is for options for parents and students to be brought into a larger political debate over education. Because what we know in public education is if students aren't reading by the time they exit the third grade, their chances for success are greatly diminished. So any type of option that we can give you uh, and that we can give your students to make sure that they're meeting their own personal education attainment goals specifically early in life, we know we're going to be creating an opportunity for them to succeed in a way that doesn't currently exist. And so my hope is that this is a program, this is something that will be able to allow you to have more options. I think I heard from, as representatives, we hear from parents, and we hear stories of students, and one of the most powerful stories that I heard was from a mother who had a son who desperately wanted to go to traditional public school, but he had severe learning disabilities. And what she was able to do was she was able to put a few of these programs together in Florida. She was from Florida where they already had these programs. And she was able to get her son the help he needed 
early in his academic career so that he was able to transition back into the traditional public school system, which is where they wanted to be from the very start. And but for that opportunity, that wouldn't have been something that would have, was possible for them. And so I think it's really important that we don't view uh, these educational opportunities as in competition with each other, but we see them as something, as a group of policies that are working in cooperation for the student and for the parent and to meet the needs that you have and you face so that your child can live the American dream. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the details because Catherine at SEAA is going to walk you through some of those, but I wanted you to know kind of what was motivating the lawmakers when we came up with this policy. I also wanted you to feel comfortable that we're going to continue to support these policies. I think the more that we can do to provide you options, uh, to give you choices that meet your individual needs, the stronger our educational uh, system is going to become in the state of North Carolina. And with, with that, I know that we're going to have a panel that will take questions later on, but I wanted to be a good steward of your time. And I know that uh, when Catherine comes, um, she's going to be able to walk you through some of the details that, will, that are going to be very important for you to understand the bill. So with that, I thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, I hope that the law that we pass is able to help you in some way. I'm excited to hear your feedback in, in just a few minutes later on in the program in case there are things that we need to do to adjust or change or tweak uh, the legislation that we've passed. And I just really appreciate you uh, supporting these options for parents and students. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Barefoot. By way of introduction, my name is Brian Jonas, uh, Vice President for Communications and Outreach at Parents for Educational Freedom. Uh, how about another round of applause uh, for our distinguished guest, Casey? <laughs> uh, so I'm excited to bring uh, Bob Lukey up to the stage next, and he's got a great presentation for you guys to give you some perspective sort of where North Carolina is in the greater picture of all this. Uh, Bob is the Director of Policy for the Civitas in Institute, a state-based policy organization He's been involved in educational reform efforts at the federal and state level for the better part of three decades. He served in policy, research, and consulting positions in Wisconsin, the federal government, as well as the private sector. Since 2007, he's helped Civitas focus on improving K-12 and higher education and expanding educational focus on opportunities for all North Carolinians while providing insightful polling and analysis. Please welcome Bob Lukia. Good evening. How's everyone? I'm kind of a walker, so uh, bear with me. It's good to be here tonight. I wanted to thank uh, PFNC and the Autism Society for uh, sponsoring this. These have really been, this is the third one, and these have really been helpful, I think, in getting parents the information they need and, and telling them about the options for the new legislation. I also wanted to personally thank uh, Senator Gerfel. Uh, you remember the meeting I think initially on in 2013 and seeing it come to fruition is is uh, very rewarding not only for me but I think everyone else that's here. So um, there's been a lot going on in parental choice in the last uh, decade uh, and I want to talk about uh, a little bit about that progress for the last uh, the last 10 years and also kind of from a 40,000 foot level. Catherine will talk about the nuts and bolts of the, um, the program, um, the ESA program, but I wanted to talk about what's been going on nationally. Now, uh, just for some parameters, when we talk about parental choice, we're talking about either public or private programs. Public programs are what we talk about in, um, charter schools, intra and inter district choice, uh, magnet schools, town tuitioning programs, also, uh, in some cases, homeschooling. We're not talking about those options tonight. We're talking about private school options, which are uh, tax credit, uh, tax credit uh, programs, tax and uh, tax credit scholarships, vouchers, and also ESAs. So nationally, how many programs do we have? This chart, uh, the first two charts are actually from a group called um, 
at Choice, formerly Friedman Foundation. They track a lot of this stuff every year. And I thought some of these charts would be helpful for us. As you can see, uh, if you look at the 2017 uh, far right bar, we have 61 programs. If you look at even like say 2010, only 26. There's been a lot of activity on the state level uh, in those programs. As you can see, the colors, they coordinate the different types of programs, of vouchers and ESAs, which are actually the very top, the very top color up there, the kind of the, the uh, purplish red tax credit scholarships, the yellow, and then the, the darker yellow tax credit and, uh, and deduction programs. So the point here, in the last, say, seven years, a lot of activity nationally. Okay, 61 programs. How many students are involved here? You can't see that on the end. We're talking about 450,000 nationally. Spread amongst those programs, those different types of programs that I mentioned before, ESAs on the bottom, about 11,000, and then the various voucher and, and the tax credit and tax uh, scholarship programs. But 450,000, again, look at about 2010, it's about uh, a little less than half of that. So there's been significant activity in the states on the number of programs involved. Okay, now if we transfer to, that's North Carolina, let's talk about North Carolina. And as Gerald had said previously, and I'd agree with him, there are a few states that have accomplished as much with regards to uh, parental, parental choice programs as North Carolina. Three types of programs here, Opportunity Scholarship, Special Needs Scholarship, and the new uh, Personal Education Savings Accounts. Average rewards we see in the left column, middle number, the uh, middle number the, represents the enrollment. What I didn't want to bring out with those two uh, numbers in parentheses, that was the initial number the first year of the program. So you can see these programs, the two, the Special Needs Program, Opportunity Scholarship have grown dramatically in the, the short lifespan that each of them have had. Budget Opportunity Scholarship, 20, about 25 million, that's going to increase significantly this year, uh, thanks to the support of legislators. Special Needs Scholarship, about almost 6 million, and the program that we're talking about tonight, the ESA program, about 3 million. Okay, a lot of activity. Why did this happen? In 2011, there was a lifting of the uh, charter school cap, and that was kind of the, the first, uh, first salvo, I guess, in a lot of pent up demand for more choice amongst the parents. As you know, we do polling just about every month on a variety of issues. One of the issues that we poll significantly on is education. And one issue that we poll have polled a lot over the years is parents and schooling. We asked this question last month. Who is best suited to decide where a child should attend school? You look at the numbers, it's overwhelming. 75% believe that the child's parents. If you look at that, the, the right half of that graphic is a breakdown by geography, a breakdown by uh, political affiliation, and a breakdown by sex. You can see in all these columns, overwhelmingly people believe it's the parent. This is very strong data. It's also data that, as I said, this was in October. If you look at previous polls that we have done on this, they're similar, similarly strong numbers. Um, low 70s, mid 70s, even one poll, 81%. So this is what's driving a lot of the debate. We also polled on personal education savings accounts. This was again in October. Um, you can see the divide here, 46% support, 37% opposed. Actually, I think a lot of supporters are quite pleased with those numbers because if you look at a lot of the data, people aren't that familiar with this program. And we explained a little bit in the question, as you can see on the bottom of the red down there, uh, if you support the program, what it's, uh, what people think the advantages would be or the disadvantages, and we ask them, do you support or oppose it? Um, one thing I did want to say kind of parenthetically here, if you want any of these slides, I'd be happy to give them to you. Just, I have some cards on the, on the table back there, but I think this is really important information. So, 
Uh, again, so you see the support, the big support for the strong support for education savings accounts. So um, that's kind of a brief overview of where we've been. The, uh, I'm really excited because I believe, as many others do, that ESAs are the future of, of parental school choice. And one of the reasons is because, as, as, as uh, Senator Barefoot said before, they allow parents to access the best education options for their children. Six states have ESAs. North Carolina became the sixth state uh, earlier this year. And the, the great thing about those programs is that they can be tailored to each state. Each one of these programs is differently, is, operates differently and has a different, little different tweak based on the parents and based on how they were put together. But uh, I think it'll, it, it will be a great opportunity for parents to access these and get a really good education for their children. So be happy to ask you the questions later and look forward to Catherine telling us a little bit about um, the specifics of the program. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Allison Gunther, Outreach Director for Parents for Educational Freedom in North Carolina. I'm sure a few of you got my emails over the past couple days, uh, so it's nice to put a face with a name and vice versa. I'd like to introduce you to Katherine Marker. She is the Director of Grants, Training, and Outreach at the State Education Assistance Authority, which is the division that administers North Carolina's K-12 programs. She started at the Authority in 2014. She has a K-12 background as a former high school teacher and also taught in the teacher preparation program at NC State while she was earning her doctorate. She graduated with a PhD in Educational Research and Policy Analysis in May of 2016. And now, Catherine, please come tell us about the ESAs. Good evening. Um, I'm Catherine Marker, and I am from the State Education Assistance Authority, the SEAA. So we are a state agency, and um, we have long been uh, North Carolina's administrative agency for financial aid, so for financial aid and higher education. So we manage the state grant programs for North Carolina and a number of other scholarship and grant programs for students to go to college. In fact, when our students graduate from high school in the K-12 programs, we tell them to go visit CFNC, where they can plan, apply, and pay for college. And that's um, the brand, the website that we uh, support as part of our work in higher education. But I'm here tonight, of course, because of the K-12 programs. I'm the director of the division that administers those programs. And I have with me two colleagues here in the front, Sean Henderson and Tiffany Jada. So afterwards, if you have any questions, the three of us are working together on the implementation of the ESAs. So we would be glad to talk you through some of the specifics afterwards if that helps. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ESA from a practical detail, from a practical level. I can give you some specifics on eligibility and the application process and the our process of reviewing those applications and so forth. And then I'll kind of go into broad strokes for how the program will look for those students and families that are awarded. You know, we've been working quickly to get the application ready in a short amount of time, so that work we front-loaded and we can give details on. And then we'll, as I said, sketch in broad strokes how the program works once a student's been awarded, because that's farther down. We don't have all those document, documents and all of those policies and procedures to that detail. So. We also do, as you, you heard, we, our agency also administers the Opportunity Scholarship, which is an income-based program for students um, who choose to attend, whose families choose for them to attend a private school. We also do the Special Needs Scholarship Grant for Children with Disabilities. We call it the Disabilities Grant. And that program also helps families, whether they're in home school or going to a private school. The third program is the ESA that we're here to talk about tonight. All three of those programs are to des uh, designed to um, offer school choice to families. And both the disabilities, the disabilities grant and the ESA are for students attending a registered private school or a home school. And they both will, both the disabilities grant and the ESA will cover tuition and required fees as well as certain other expenses that are related to 
um, educating a child with a disability. What's unique about the ESA is that the funds aren't dispersed directly to the school from our agency to the school. We don't reimburse families based on receipts. The ESA offers families access to the funds on a quarterly basis with a debit card. So that's a unique aspect of this ESA. Our agency is SEAA, the North Carolina SEAA, and we will manage the process. We are administrators of the program. The schools that will take the debit cards need to be participating schools. We work with the schools and connect with them about their requirements. We do applications, review for eligibility, notify people, stay in communication with people, and make awards. And then when it comes time for the funds, we manage the disbursement of the funds to those debit cards and the follow-up that families would have as a result. So the non-public schools that participate in the program, a school has to be registered with the Division of Non-Public Education. North Carolina has an agency that works with private schools and home schools. So that's the first step for a school. And then there's a process that the school registers with us, with the SEAA. So it's not a difficult process. If a school wants to do that, then they're already registered with DNPE, the Division of Non-Public Education. It's a very short next step. There are some documents to fill out if it's the very first time. If it's the school's already registered for the Opportunity Scholarship or the Disabilities Grant, then it's even easier to, to add their, their participation. So we have a list of these schools on the website. However, right now there's a, a list of schools and a column that says Opportunity Scholarship and a column that says Disabilities Grant. Within the next month, there'll be a column, a third column that says ESA. And so that way you would know if the school you're considering has agreed to participate in all three or if they're participating in just one, I would go to them and ask why. Because it may just be they haven't had anyone pursue it at their school. So in the meantime, if you're looking in the next month and you kind of want to know, I would talk to the school official. If the school official says, I don't know, what is an ESA or how do I do it? Then you can refer that person to our office and we'll take it from there. So something unique about the ESA, you see, you see this question up here? The answer is yes. Um, there's a, a caveat, and that is that uh, a student can attend a public school part-time and a private school part-time if that private school, that non-public school, is a school that exclusively serves children with disabilities. Now, whether that's a school like, if you've heard of the Hill Center or Mariposa, or there are other schools that exclusively serve uh, children with disabilities. So one thing that we intend to do is to identify those schools on the list when we post that the school is participating in ESA. We intend to have an asterisk or some other indication that school exclusively serves children with disabilities. Um, and again, in the meantime, if that's the route you're going to go, it may be that you need to, in the next month or so, call and talk to someone in our office or um, you can talk to the school and get a better understanding if that's the route you're going to take. So what types of expenses? Tuition, first of all, you would use the debit card to pay for tuition. Um, and again, I bet the text below explains a little bit about the registration process. You can't just choose any school. You would need to make sure that you've identified a school that has um, agreed to participate in the program. There are several other categories besides tuition. We've listed a few of the big categories here, and then we kind of have an other expenses at the bottom. So, Tuition and teaching, excuse me, tutoring and teaching. This might be a student who's at a private school who requires additional tutoring beyond the school day. Could be a homeschool family that's seeking some expertise for particular tutoring or teaching. Then those providers, whether it's someone you seek out on an after school basis or if you're a homeschool family and you're looking for additional um, help with reading, those providers would need to be qualified. Uh, an example would be someone with a teaching certificate. That's not the only way to be a qualified provider, but that's one way. Other uh, category of expenses is educational therapies. So these would be uh, speech therapy or physical therapy, some other kind of therapy that a student needs in order to benefit from his education. And again, a practitioner or a provider needs to hold recognized credentials. So um, generally, if a provider is at a clinic, uh, you know, a professional clinic, then there's not a question about their credentials. If that person is an independent person that you somehow are connecting with to provide services, then we might ask for some documentation of their 
qualifications. But a lot of times, you know, your speech therapy is at a, is at a particular clinic, and that's a qualified provider. Educational technology. Um, if you're interested in um, finding more about this particular category, there's a, uh, an information already available online because the Disabilities Grant also offers um, the ability to reimburse families. In the case of the Disabilities Grant, it's a reimbursement to the families. And that is for educational technology. So we have a list existing that we can kind of talk through with you. But basically, it, it's educational technology that's designed for a student with a disability. It might be an adaptive keyboard or something similar. But it could also just be a computer. It doesn't have to be a special computer. It could be a, a, a tablet of some sort. So there are some things about that that, you know, as with anything, that there are some details. But again, that's already all laid out. So if you're thinking, well, that's really important, then that information is available. And it's online because it exists for the Disabilities Grant already. And then with the ESA, there are some other expenses that might, um, would be acceptable for the use of the debit card, textbooks, um, transportation. If the family is seeking transportation expenses from a company or an entity that regularly provides transportation, and it's back and forth to, to an educational event. So more information about that and some of the other expenses is coming soon. We are in the process of developing a family manual, and it should be A to Z, everything you need to know about working with the ESA. Um, it's almost ready, and it should be online within the next few weeks. So that kind of details exactly what those other expenses are will be in that manual. So eligibility. So an eligible student has to meet all of these requirements. Has to be five years old, uh, can't have graduated from high school, has to live in North Carolina, and that just means you can't live in South Carolina and go to school in North Carolina and benefit from this program. You, just, you need to live in North Carolina. Um, and is a child with a disability as documented by the IEP? So there are really two main pieces of eligibility. One is documenting the disability, that's the IEP. And then the other is what we call enrollment eligibility. So that's on the next slide. So eligibility, an eligible student meets all of these things, resident, five years old, hasn't gotten a high school diploma, and has a, uh, an IEP from the North Carolina Public Schools. So then a student has to meet one of these requirements, and this is what we might call the enrollment piece, although not all of them, not all of these things are related directly to enrollment. So for the first year, we won't have any renewal students, but Going forward, that would be one way to meet this requirement, is you've received the ESA previously. Or you were a full-time student attending a North Carolina public school or a Department of Defense school in North Carolina for the spring semester. So applying in February, you're in public school that semester, that second half of this year in public school. Or parent on full-time active military duty, or entering kindergarten or first grade, or in foster care, or recently adopted. So a student needs to meet one of these criteria as well as the others. So five years old, resident of North Carolina, don't have a high school diploma, has an IEP, and one of these. So um, you can kind of think about that a little bit and think about your situation and, and maybe afterwards, if you're not sure, it's a lot of verbiage there. Okay, so we know North Carolina has three programs. Can you apply for more than one? Yes, you can. So that for a new student, for a new student who doesn't currently have an award from any of the programs, I would advise a family to look carefully at all three to see which might be the best fit, maybe more than one. So I, I said earlier briefly that the Opportunity Scholarship is an income-based program, does not have a requirement about a disability. The Disabilities Grant, and this new ESA don't have an income uh, requirement. They're not income-based. And they do have a uh, requirement that a student have a disability as documented, both of them, by the North Carolina IEP. But there are families that cross over. We have currently, we have families who receive both the Disabilities Grant and the Opportunity Scholarship. We call those our dual recipients. And it just works out that they meet both sets of requirements. They applied for both in the same year, and they were able to be awarded both um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So in order to receive um, the Opportunity Scholarship and either the Disabilities or the ESA, you just need to be eligible for both. 
in order to receive both of the two programs, an award from the two programs that are both designed for students with disabilities, there's kind of a second level, a second eligibility criteria. So that part, I don't have anything ready to hand to you, but there are specific diagnoses that a student would have, and then that student would be eligible to apply. Well, anyone's eligible to apply, but a student would be eligible to receive both the Disabilities Grant and the ESA if they not only have an IEP, but further have a specific diagnosis for that eligibility for the North Carolina IEP. I can talk to you a little bit more about that later, just because, I mean, we know how it's going to work. I just At the time this PowerPoint was created, we didn't have that ironed out. We now do, and that's also the kind of information that will be in the family manual. So, um, and again, if you're a new family and you, I would kind of lay these three out in, in front and think about which one suits better for various reasons. Um, there are two program overviews, one for the opportunity and one for the disabilities, as well as this one. They look real similar. We tried to keep them similar in format so it wouldn't be too difficult to kind of lay them together and say, this is how this one works, this is how this one works. So opportunity has a program overview. Disabilities has a program overview, and this is what we call our program overview for the ESA. Now, one other thing on this, I want to point out that the time frame is different. So the Opportunity Scholarship, the income-based program, and this ESA both will open on February 1st. So you, if you feel like you're eligible for both, you can do one, submit, and do the other, submit. We will take applications from February 1st through the priority deadline of March the 1st. So it's to your advantage, if you're serious about either the opportunity or the ESA, to apply sometime in February. Doesn't matter really if it's February 1st, but somewhere in February, because the priority deadline is March the 1st. Of the eligible applicants that are received by March the 1st, there's a lottery. Assuming there are more eligible students than there are funds, which we do anticipate that. Every year of opportunity scholarships existence, we've had a lottery in order to identify the students that can receive an award. So we take the eligible applicants and they're in a lottery and the number, a random number is assigned to, to establish the, the priority order. We will keep the applications open after March the 1st if there's a chance that we might have funds for students. So we close the application when it becomes abundantly clear that there are enough eligible students for the funds. We know there will be more funds if, if once we know that we see that there are eligible applicants, then we close those applications to kind of bring it into the, that particular cycle. So February 1st for the opportunity and the ESA, May the 1st. May the 1st for the disabilities grant. So kind of when you're laying them out there, you can um, put your dates on the calendar. We also have a document that is available online. It's a side by side by side. So it's like the three programs side by side, and it kind of gives the dates, the eligibility, the key differences between them, that's a useful document if you're like, oh, which one? Um, and that's on our website now, so that is something we have. Okay, you want to apply? It's online. There are no paper applications, it's all online. Our contact with families is via email. We have a great customer service staff of uh, several people, and uh, Tiffany and Sean and I also talk to a lot of families. So we respond to your questions and, and so forth via phone. But when we reach out to families, it's via email, so you have to have a good, you know, working email that you check regularly when you apply. So always via email. Okay, when? Timing. Talked about this a little bit already. February the 1st. And again, you know, a month or six weeks ago, we were a little nervous about getting this application ready. Are we going to have it ready by February the 1st? I can say definitively it will be ready on February the 1st. So, um, although you should still familiarize yourself with our website and kind of check back for things as you, you know, between now and February 1st, but it, it will be ready by the 1st. Okay, if you're um, thinking about that IEP or if it's not familiar to you, let me just show you real quickly what that document is. So the IEP is issued by the North Carolina Public Schools. There's a specific document, and those of you who are familiar with the public school IEP process, you know you got a stack of papers like this, you got a big box maybe in your closet or under the bed. We want you to find the most recent DEC 3, DEC 3. It says eligibility determination across the top, it's one to two pages. It's not perhaps the most recent document you've received. Public schools do that every three years and as the student moves through the, the process in, in, the, in public schools. 
Now that's for initial eligibility. There's a blurb up here about continuing eligibility. Um, that is for a student who demonstrates initial eligibility, gets awarded, and then two years later it needs to be updated. Their, their evaluation is outdated. They then have a couple of options for their um, re-evaluation. I won't go into that now because we're kind of talking about initial first steps. And initial eligibility is a North Carolina public school IEP. Timeline, so you apply on February 1st, you know, you check your email, you find things out. So you should hear from the program within a couple of weeks of submitting your application. Um, maybe it'll just be access to a portal so you know how to get information. And we can say, well, you appear to be eligible and, or you appear not to be eligible. Um, and if you appear to be eligible, here's the information about the lottery and so forth. Ultimately, awards, so you would know for sure, is in early April. So here's the part where I move from really specific to the broad strokes. And that is, how does it actually work? I mean, it's a debit card, so it's a debit card. Um, and I'll give you some, you know, kind of a framework of how it could look. So the debit card is issued to the parent. We don't disperse funds to schools for the ESA. We see that the funds get dispersed to the debit card. So the debit card is loaded with the money. Uh, and then the parent uses that debit card. They don't pay for things out of their pocket and submit receipts. They use this debit card with the provider. They use the debit card at, on Amazon or at a teacher supply store or wherever they're purchasing their their curriculum or their textbooks or of course for tuition and that's at the school. So the amount is $9,000 annually. That would be divided into four equal installments, if you will. And it's based on the fiscal year rather than fall semester, spring semester. So we're looking at July, August, September as quarter one, a fourth of the money. There are some requirements of the parents to submit an expense report. And depending on how the purchase was made, maybe receipts, this is the part that I can't give you the very, very detailed um, instructions about. But there are some requirements of the parents to submit documentation. Assuming the parents submit that document, there's uh, a rolling basis there with each quarter where the funds are loaded again for the second quarter and the third quarter and the fourth quarter. So this is kind of meant to be an overview. So we're actually going to publish our family manual in part one, which is everything up to this point, and then part two, which will be, here's what the expense report needs to look like, and here's uh, the type of receipt documentation you need. That probably won't be available until you know, February or March. But again, I'd be glad to talk through this with someone on the phone. We, our staff can talk you through it if you just need the information in order to make a decision sooner. All right, there is our contact information. Again, we are the State Education Assistance Authority, a state agency. That's the website. You click on K-12, because we also do the higher education financial aid, so you want to direct yourselves to K-12. There's a section for the non-public schools themselves, section for opportunity, section for disabilities, and then there's a section for ESA. And the two pieces of information that are out there right now are this. Uh, program review and the two-page document that's like all three programs summarized side by side. So you're welcome to call or to email or to call. We have people who answer the phones, live people who actually talk to you between um, 9 and 5.